you need at least 100,000 triangles. Okay, so it's not 1,000, it's 100,000. And when you think of a 3D MRI scan, for instance, today, it's a cube with around 500 uh, pixel resolution in each of the three axes. And so it's a volume with hundreds of thousands of uh, voxels, so hundreds of megabytes, maybe up to one gigabyte per image. Okay, and so how do you scale things on, image that, on images that weigh one gigabyte instead of one megabyte? The second one, uh, the second big motivation is public health, okay? And that's because in this field, you know, epidemiology, uh, pharmacovigilance, uh, the size of medical data sets that are available to us has completely blown up, okay? Like the field of uh, pharmacovigilance and uh, clinical trials, you know, is, is built around standard clinical trials where you have maybe 1,000 patients in a controlled environment. That's what uh, the culture is about. But then recently, uh, starting from 2005 and now 2010, 2015, we have started to get access to large uh, curated data sets of maybe five, 500,000 people. And today, uh, through the French Health Data Hub, uh, basically the French government has made available for, to researchers like me, to research at, at INSERM and INRIA, the full social security da data of all French citizens over the last 20 years. Okay, like personally, I have, I have access now to all the records from the Carte Vitale, to all the reimbursement data from all of us uh, over the last 10 years for me and 20 years for the people at INSERM. So out of nowhere, we have access to 70 million uh, time series of drug consumptions that we would like to process. Okay? And so this availability of data has created a need, okay? like medical doctors, pharmacists and governments, especially during the COVID crisis, uh, desire scalable methods. So how can we provide, uh, provide them uh, to, to these colleagues? So, I mean, the field of scaling up mathematical computations to million or billion scale data sets uh, is a field that is moving fast, okay? Because we want to, uh, to scale up model that combine model expertise with, mo with modern data sets. And we have access to a new type of uh, processing hardware, to, of computing hardware, uh, which are called uh, graphics processing units. And just as a quick poll, like how many of you uh, have actually ever used a GPU, a graphics processing unit? Like if you could raise your hand, is it like 50% or less than that? Okay, like 20% of you have used the GPU. And how many of you just know what it is? Okay, okay, so a GPU, especially if you're a gamer, uh, probably you know what it is. So, a graphics processing unit, okay, it's a, it's a bit of hardware which has been primarily marketed to uh, video game enthusiasts, but that you can understand from the, from the outside as just a farm of CPU cores that are sold to you uh, at a very low price. Basically, it's a bulk of CPU cores. So today, if you have uh, 1,000 euros and you want to buy computing power, Probably the most cost-effective way of buying cores is just to buy a recent uh, GPU uh, designed by NVIDIA, and you're going to buy around 1,000 cores, and since each of those cores has a computing capacity of about a billion operations per second, you know, a gigahertz, then for 1,000 euros, you can buy 1,000 billion operations per second, okay, which is way more cost-effective than what you would get if you try to buy, you know, um, a slice of an HPC cluster. Okay, so that's big motivation, uh, completely game changer uh, in the field of scientific computing, okay, the, 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 the new availability of this kind of power. But the problem is that obviously this is not one processor that runs at 1,000 billion operations per second. It's 1,000 workers that you have to manage all working in parallel. Okay? And if you try to take lectures on parallel computing, you quickly realize that the bottleneck is not so much uh, the number of computations, but the number of memory accesses that you make. Because if you try to coordinate uh, a big room full of 1,000 uh, mathematicians, you know, making ca calculations, the bottleneck is uh, going to be what happens when all of the mathematicians, all the cores, uh, want to get up, go to the library, and fetch information. Okay. So in, uh, in computer science uh, lingo, we say that the, the big bottleneck in GPU computing is uh, memory accesses or the, the usage of registers, okay? The small, um, the small memory buffers that are located close to the compute cores. So we have this uh, kind of tantalizing Eldorado where 
we can buy extremely powerful computers, but that are very hard to program, because if you cannot manage uh, all those memory accesses by yourself, uh, you're going to get subpar performance. So that was the environment in GPU computing 10 years ago. And then probably uh, you've heard about the deep learning revolution, uh, which is primarily a software revolution. Okay. Like uh, what deep learning really uh, brought to the scientific computing community is a set of high level user friendly uh, Python libraries that are consolidated around a small number of key operations, but that come with a GPU backend. Okay, so you can think of those, deep, of those deep learning libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX as re-implementations of MATLAB uh, or uh, NumPy that have a GPU backend. Okay? And basically those libraries work because the developers of those libraries plus uh, the hardware manufacturers like NVIDIA made the effort of uh, providing high quality binaries for uh, what they believed were the core operations in scientific computing. And what they believed were the core operations are essentially uh, dense matrix matrix products, fast Fourier transforms, and convolutions on grids. Okay? And that's in this environment that uh, so many researchers started to work on convolutional uh, architectures like convolutional neural networks because those are the operations that are, that are easy to implement using uh, user-friendly Python libraries. Okay? So that's, I mean, if, you, if you've ever went to uh, an AI conference, etc., this is uh, the hardware and software stack on which we build our research. Okay? We buy GPUs and we use uh, those user-friendly Python libraries. So that's massive success, obviously. But there's a problem, which is what happens if you want to design a model, if you want to design an algorithm that cannot be expressed efficiently using matrix-matrix products, convolutions on grids, and fast Fourier transforms. For instance, what if you want to compute nearest neighbor queries okay, uh, between point clouds? Of course, you could try to, uh, if you have one million points and you want to perform nearest neighbor query on a cloud of one million points, you could decide to build a large matrix of distances, but that would be pretty slow, okay? Because if you have one million points, the matrix of distances has one million rows, one million columns. So it would weigh around a terabyte and it would never fit in your memory and, and you have to, to move around all those things, okay? And so, what happens is that, um, obviously, you know that it's possible to work with uh, point clouds with one million points. So obviously, people are able to, uh, to implement nearest neighbor queries with those kind of data. But uh, basically, the most effective schemes are not really supported out of the box by those deep learning libraries like PyTorch, TensorFlow. Okay? And so in this context, I would say the most important thing that I did uh, in my uh, career is to um, create with two colleagues, Benjamin Charlie and Joanne Glones, a library that is called KeyOps and that provides very effect efficient support for symbolic matrices. Basically, so key, um, by symbolic matrix, I mean matrices that we like to think of as large uh, arrays, but that actually come, uh, that, that, are, that can actually be encoded using a small formula that is evaluated on data arrays. So what I mean is that uh, think, for instance, of a distance matrix. If you have uh, 1 million points xi, 1 million points hj, yj, and you want to perform nearest nearby queries, symbolically, you want to create a 1 million by 1 million uh, matrix. But you know that from a computational perspective, probably it's going to be more compact and thus cheaper to encode it using uh, a formula, so like the square Euclidean distance or any distance that you like, that you're going to evaluate on the fly. Okay. So this also applies to kernel matrices uh, and to numerous transforms, like a discrete Fourier transform. Basically, all the big operators that we manipulate in applied mathematics, we think of them as, as matrices, but from, from a CS perspective, it's more efficient to think of them as symbolic matrices okay, instead of dense matrix. So, you know, uh, so this library, KeyOps, uh, that you can uh, download here, it's an extension for PyTorch, NumPy, uh, MATLAB, and R that really supports very optimized numerical schemes to manipulate those objects, both on CPU and on GPU. 
So it fully supports automatic differentiation, and under the hood, it relies on the just-in-time compilation of very optimized uh, C++ schemes okay, that are triggered uh, whenever you want to perform a new reduction, like a sum, a min, etc. And now, you know, maybe if you've never thought about computations, you think, okay, I mean, why should I care about this? Well, you should care about this because the orders of magnitude are really appealing. Okay, the, the, the numbers that you should have in mind is that if the formula F that defines your symbolic matrix is simple en enough, and by simple I mean less than 100 arithmetic operations, to think a Euclidean distance in dimension three, it's completely fits the bill, then you should be able to, to perform operations, like to, to perform a matrix vector multiplications with a matrix that has 100,000 rows and 100,000 columns in 10 to 100 milliseconds. And you should be able to work with a matrix that has 1 million rows and 1 million columns in about a second, maybe 10 seconds. Okay? So those numbers, I think if, if you're used to MATLAB, NumPy, or even if you're used to PyTorch, those are very impressive. But if you think about it, it's just uh, the realization of the promise that was made by the hardware constructors. Because when you buy a GPU, you know that you buy 10 at the power 12 operations per second, and a matrix with 1 million rows, 1 million columns, has exactly 10 at the power 12 coefficients. So it makes sense that you should be able to process it in one second. Okay, so basically this curves library, it's about providing the groundwork for everything that I'm going to show you afterwards. Uh, basically, to, to allow us mathematicians to reach this hardware ceiling of 1,000 billion operations uh, per second from the comfort uh, of a PyTorch or Python interface. And just to be clear, this type of performance is one to two orders of magnitude faster than standard GPU implementations, like what people are used to with PyTorch uh, for a wide range of problems. Okay, so that's, it. that's the core of my work. And uh, since 2016, I've been working on using this knowledge of low level uh, hardware uh, tricks to speed up a wide range of operations uh, in applied mathematics. So I've worked on geometric machine learning, obviously speeding up k-nearest neighbors or kernel methods, like the speeding up the computation of kernel maximum mean discrepancies that we talked about uh, last hour. Uh, quite a bit of geometric statistics like Gaussian processes or MMDs, okay, which are equivalent to kernel methods. Uh, geometric deep learning, especially when I was in London. So point convolutions, attention layers. Today, since many of my colleagues are pharmacologists, I work a lot on survival analysis like time series, these kind of things, and obviously uh, quite a bit of optimal transport, and that's why you were kind enough to invite me today. Okay, so that's let's say the, the it was the introduction of the talk, and so now I want to show you first what are my motivations to study discrete optimal transport, and I think that's important because you know there are so many good motivations to study optimal transport that. Uh, Understanding the context in which this algorithmic research uh, is performed, I think is useful for you to understand the main limitations of the algorithms uh, that, we, that we develop. Then, show you a little bit about computational advances, basically show you visually what does uh, a state-of-the-art optimal transport solver looks like. Uh, then show you how we use it today, especially I'm going to show you how I use it in my research on 3D shape analysis, and finally, uh, let you know about open problems in the field. So what is optimal transport? Well, I think that all of you have an idea of what it is, and probably we have different ideas, okay? And personally, I like to think of it as uh, the generalization of sorting to spaces of dimension D larger than one. Okay, I don't know if that's uh, obvious to you, but why, uh, why is it a good definition? Well, the thing is that if, if we look at the baseline uh, discrete optimal transport problem, you know, the very first one, we say that we have a point cloud A, X1, Xn, uh, a target point cloud B, Y1, Yn, and we are interested in the Wasserstein distance between A and B, which is the square Euclidean distance between the Xi and the, and the y, Yj's up to permutations. So that's the first uh, textbook definition of optimal transport, the optimal transport distance between A and B, that's the minimum over uh, permutation sigma uh, in the group of permutation Sn of the average value of Xi minus Y sigma I squared. 
And what is remarkable about this uh, optimization problem is that if the xi's and the yj's all live on a longer uh, a line, a longer real line, then sigma is exactly the increasing mappings between the xi's and the yj's. For, for instance, in this example, those are the xi's, those are the yj's. You can show that the optimal sigma is the one that uh, maps x1 to y3 and x5 to y1. And it's something that you can retrieve quite easily because imagine that uh, there was a crossing somewhere, like x4 was mapped to y2 and x3 was mapped to y4. Then you would be a little bit more optimal for this link, but the distance from x3 to y4 would be pro prohibitively, lar prohibitively large. Okay, and so eventually, due to the strong con uh, convexity of the square distance function, you can show that there's going to be no crossing. Okay, and that's why we can say that this generalizes sorting, and it's interesting because basically this small definition has allowed us to talk about an increasing mapping in a metric space, okay, without ever using the ordering structure on the real line. So that's appealing, you know, because if you want to, if you want to create a new, a new standard toolbox for data scientists, then having something that behaves like sorting in small dimensional spaces, but that you can apply anywhere, obviously it's appealing. So now, as you know, maybe we don't want to work with uh, discrete point clouds, with uniform weights, okay, it's quite restrictive. And on top of that, working with combinatorial optimization problem can be, can be a bit hard. So we like to, to re-express uh, re this optimal transport problem as a linear optimization problem on a permutation matrix P, a transport plan P. Okay? And so that's why we say that this problem is equivalent to this other problem that I'm sure that you already know, uh, where OT of AB is the minimum of uh, the Xi minus YJ square with weights PIJ and you have linear constraints on the PIJ that express the fact that all source points are well transported onto the target. So that's for the definition and the first intuition. Maybe alternatively, I, th I think at least in my, in my job, it's very useful to also understand optimal transport as nearest neighbor projection with an incompressibility constraint. Okay, because this minima, this thing where you minimize the distance from xi to, the, to a point yj is exactly nearest neighbor projection. And the bijectivity constraint express the fact that two points cannot go on the same place. Okay, so from a physical perspective, think of it as incompressibility. And finally, uh, as you know, it's a fundamental example of linear optimization over this transport plan pij. So that's the three main interpretations, at least for me. And now, from a practical perspective, this theory induces two main quantities. So first, once we have defined this optimization problem, well, we can retrieve a transport plan, PIJ, that is kind of equivalent to the optimal mapping from the xi's to the y sigma i's, so it's a function. And also, we can be interested, uh, we can be interested in uh, the value of this objective function, which is called the Wasserstein distance. So those are the two products that I expect as a data scientist from uh, the optimal transport theory. And maybe also Vassar time very centers, but we'll talk about it tomorrow. Now, just to be clear, you know, how do I see uh, the optimal uh, transport plan? Uh, well, I see it as a useful tool, but that has strong limitations. Okay, and maybe it's important that I show you how in my work uh, the subject uh, is limited, uh, because obviously it's called optimal transport. So maybe we think, no, no, it's optimal. It, it's the best thing you can do. And no, clearly, for instance, for 3D shape analysis, uh, yeah, the, the limitations are, are very clear. So here I'm showing you okay, a source point cloud. That's my X size. And these are my targets, YJ. And to visualize the optimal transport mapping, you know, I call all the points. So this allows me to see that, for instance, this point was sent here, okay, before, after. I could have shown you a dynamic thing. Okay, so the first thing that you remark when you look at this picture is that optimal transport maps both point clouds on each other. So that's job done. It's smooth at most locations, but it's not smooth everywhere, obviously, as you know. So for instance, here, this, uh, this piece in the middle was split, uh, was split in, in at least two pieces. So 
So some of it was sent here, some of it was, was sent there. So that's the main caveat that we have to think of whenever we use, we use optimal transport is that there is no global uh, guarantee of topology preservation, which is unfortunate most of the time. So, I mean, if we're just interested in matching potatoes with arbitrary probability distributions, as many people do, okay, in uh, generative modeling, in, in, uh, in machine learning, then maybe we're fine with this. But, you know, personally, I'm more interested in 3D shape analysis, like bones, etc. And so, what I have to keep in mind is that, for instance, if my two shapes, if, if my source and my target point cloud are close enough, then maybe the optimal transport plan is good enough. You know, here, I had two shapes that were very close to each other geometrically, and the optimal transport map clearly induced a weird distortions here. You know, it's not uh, a nice uh, low energy bending, but at least it matched uh, this part with this part and this part with this part. So that's one. That's, I'd say this is the best case scenario for optimal transport, and this is the worst case scenario. Like, for instance, I should always keep in mind that if I try to match this moon onto this moon, I'm going, I'm going to get a result that I don't like. Okay? Because here, you can see that, for instance, this part, the, the end of the source moon, was mapped to the middle of the target moon. Like optimal transport completely uh, discarded the topological structure uh, of the input moon and behaved more as a one-dimensional sorting along the x-axis than as uh, something that you would sell to people in medical imaging as an optimal matching. So that's the uh, limitations that we have in mind. But well, that's all fine because that's for the optimal transport plan, but then the Wasserstein distance itself is also useful you know, because it's a distance, uh, it's translation aware, and more generally, you know that optimal transport with a squared Euclidean cost retrieves a unique gradient of a convex function that maps your source distribution onto the target. And once again, being the gradient of a convex function generalizes the fact of being an increasing mapping from dimension one to dimension two, three, four, five, six. So second appealing properties. And finally, maybe the most uh, motivating uh, fact about optimal transport in data sciences is probably the fact that optimal transport induces a geometry aware distance between probability distributions, right? So think of the Gauss map that takes as input a mean value and a, stand and a standard deviation, m sigma, and gives you uh, yeah, a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution, n of m sigma squared, on the real line. Then to, 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 to metrize the space of, of uh, Gaussian distributions, or to understand distance on the space of probability distribution, you can say, okay, maybe I can endo the full space of probability distributions with a given metric, and then pull it back on the space of parameters m sigma, and look at what I get. And then it's a very standard famous uh, results on information geometry and statistical manifolds that if you endow the space of probability distributions on the real line with a relative entropy, like with a fischer hau metric, then the metric that you're going to recover on the space M sigma is the Poincaré uh, metric on the upper half plane. So that's one type of canonical structure on the upper half plane. But maybe even more interestingly, if, if you endow the space of probability distributions with a, Ga uh, with a Wasserstein metric induced by optimal transport, the pullback metric that you recover on your space M sigma is exactly Euclid the Euclidean metric. And so this means that if you want to interpolate between this Gaussian distribution here and this Gaussian distribution, then you, you can simply uh, interpolate linearly uh, for... Uh, the mean value and the standard deviation. So it means that optimal transport is a theory that generalizes this appealing behavior, this very geometric behavior, to all simple probability distributions. Okay, and so the message that I want you to recall from this maybe is that optimal transport, it's kind of perfect for very simple distributions. It's good enough for very simple uh, distances, and probably it's very bad uh, as soon as you try to to handle distributions that are far away from each other. But, okay, it's, it's still good motivation. Now, 
maybe one way of, see, of seeing that even more clearly is that we can use the uh, uh, Wasserstein distance to define barycentric interpolations in uh, the space of probability distribution. To do that, basically, we just have to solve a least square problem, a Frisch mean. So, in general, a Frisch mean uh, in a metric space is a solution, an argument of this optimization, where you have as input, let's say, four, um, four input distributions, B1, B2, B3, B4, that I display here, B1, B2, B3, B4. And you're going to say, for instance, that the average of those four probability distribution is the argmin of uh, the sum of one, one divided by four times a loss function from A to B1 plus a loss function from A to B2 plus a loss function from A to B3 plus a loss, a loss function from A to B4. And then depending on the metric that you have defined on the space of probability distributions, you are going to recover different types of interpolations. Okay, so just to be clear, here in the middle, uh, the weights lambda i are all equal to each other. And elsewhere on the square, I choose the weights by uh, bilinear interpolations. So here, for instance, the weights are equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, here, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, et cetera. Okay, and then what's interesting is that if I use a Sobolev norm or a, a square Euclidean norm or a kernel norm on this, uh, between my probability densities, then I'm just going to recover a Euclidean interpolation, like a pointwise interpolation of the densities. And most of the time, this is, you know, at least for shape-like distribution, uh, this is not what we want. Whereas, uh, most appealingly, if here I use uh, the Wasserstein distance between probability distributions, then I'm going to recover those kind of nice uh, geometric interpolations. Okay, uh, displacement Lagrangian-like uh, interpolations. And you see this is only going to work if my uh, distributions are close enough to each other. But that's, I would say, lots of good reasons to study uh, the optimal transport problem. And now, you, you know, with this prerequisite in mind, how should you solve it? Like, given this optimization problem, what are the efficient algorithms that we can design uh, to tackle it? Okay. So this has been a fundamental problem okay, in applied mathematics for a long time. And if you look at the literature since at least the 1940s, you can see that every decade, uh, people either make improvements or rediscover previous ideas and shed a new light on them. So maybe the first uh, fundamental result uh, is uh, the duality of Kantorovich. Basically, when Kantorovich understood that this linear optimization problem you know, a priori, it's a problem on a, on a variable of size n by n. So a priori, it's something that cannot scale because if you have n points, the memory footprint uh, of your optimization variable is in O of n squared. And so you're never going to be able to scale this up to n uh, larger than 1 million. So that's the primal optimal transport problem. And then Kontorovich understood that it, this problem is equivalent to a, a simpler optimization problem on dual variables that have the same memory footprint as the input densities. Right? So basically in the 1940s, we understood that it was possible to solve the OT problem in O of n uh, memory. But then O memory. But then which is the best that you can get, because obviously you're, you're going to at least have to look at every value of the, of the input density. And then since then, okay, all the work has been about reducing the time complexity of the algorithm. So in the 1950s, people came up with diverse combinatorial algorithms. I think the most famous, famous one is the Hungarian method, which is cubic. Okay, so it's known that if you have a real like this combinatorial optimal, optimal transport problem and you want to solve it exactly if you want to actually recover the optimal uh, sigma or the optimal p, you're going to have to pay an O of n square, uh, an O of n cube. And maybe that's the best you can do and in the very general case, that's the best you can do. So that, that was for the 1950s. And then in the 1970s, you know, you have people 
around operations research, we understood that if you lowered your expectations on optimal solutions, you could get quadratic algorithms. So what do I mean by lowering my expectations? You know? Okay, you can think of optimal transport as a minimization of a convex objective on a space of permutations. Okay, and you can show that getting the exact solution in the general case is going to be expensive. But what those people in the 1970s understood is that if you accept just to get a solution which is epsilon close in the value of the objective from the optimal solution, then you, you can find algorithms that are going to have quadratic complexity. And then the question of, is it good enough for you, is heavily going to depend on the structure of your point clouds, on the structure of your distance matrix. Why is that so? That's because the intuition that we have in data sciences is that if our input samples are low dimensional, then there is structure. And basically, your, your matrix of distances is going to have values that are both uh, high and low. You're going, if you look at the distance matrix of a point cloud, you're going to have very var uh, different values. So, uh, in terms of this optimization problem, this means that the, the optimal transport cost is going to be quite peaky, right? Because there's going to be a big difference between, fi between finding a good coupling and a bad coupling. So, having, this means that having an epsilon guarantee on the value of the, optimi of the optimal transport problem is going to, be, to, to produce a fairly good approximation of the optimal transport plan. On the other hand, if you are in a very high dimensional scenario, if your cost matrix has little structure, then the intuition is that this optimization problem is very flat. So it looks more like this. And then in this regime, basically in the very high dimensional regime, we can show that it's still possible to get epsilon good approximation of the optimal transport costs, but this epsilon approximation does not translate into a very good approximation of the optimal transport plan. Okay, that's all, that's what we call the curse of dimensionality in all fields of machine learning, and as far as optimal transport is concerned, the curse of dimensionality means that basically your optimal transport plan is nearly as good as any random permutation of your input point clouds. Okay, so that's kind of a strong limit on what you can expect from optimal transport in any case. So that was for, for the 1970s. And then people in the 90s understood that you could soften the auction algorithm to make it easier to study. Basically, it's easier to study uh, a differentiable algorithm than to study a combinatorial algorithm. And they call this algorithm the, this algorithm the synchron algorithm or the soft assign algorithm. They understood that if you combined it with simulated annealing, you could get a better constant in front of your O of n squared. And around, two, around 20 years ago, this method became super standard, uh, super standard in, uh, in 3D shape analysis. Okay? Using optimal transport, using the Wasserstein distance as a loss function for shape registration problem, it's called robust point matching, and it's very standard. You have Wikipedia page, pages on that. So that's for, let's say, the people that we don't, I, I don't know personally. Uh, and as you probably know, over the last decade, there has been a renewed interest uh, in this problem. Okay? Basically, people have worked a lot to go, beyond, um, to go beyond those algorithms. And I think you have two main strains of ideas, two, two main uh, paths. So the first is that, especially in the machine learning community, people are used to using GPUs. And then, nearly 10 years ago now, uh, you have Marco Couturier, Couturier who reinvented the Syncor algorithm and realized that it was very easy to implement using a GPU because you could cast it as a succession of matrix multiplication algorithms. So motivated people, basically it allowed people to realize that this problem could be solved on parallel hardware, which is great. And then another uh, path of work is that you have people like Quentin Merigo, I know she's here, uh, Bruno Levy or Bernard Schmitzer, who progressively understood that at least in low dimensional settings, we should be able to get a log linear algorithm. Okay? And this makes sense because 
the intuition that we have is that optimal transport is what generalizes sorting, and we know that in dimension one, there, uh, the quick sort algorithm is a log linear algorithm to solve uh, the, to solve uh, to, to sort uh, a list of, of numbers, and so we expect that in low dimensional settings, we should have uh, log linear algorithms that work, you know, with a constant that gets worse and worse as you increase the dimension of the point clouds, the dimension of the space in which the point clouds live, and so and with the idea that maybe in dimension ten or more it becomes quadratic. Yeah, but that's, that's the space of, uh, of algorithms that have been studied a lot over the last decade. And me personally, I've worked in this field also. And today, you know, after basically a decade of research in this field, we have uh, multi-scale synchron algorithms you know, that combine all those, all those ideas together on the GPU that behave a bit like generalized uh, quick sort algorithms. Okay, so I mean, yes. So, yes, so basically after the Hungarian method, everything is approximate. And, and especially they are approximate in the sense that they are going to give you a solution which, is, which has an epsilon good cost. And this epsilon good cost is good enough if you're working in three different instance. In high dimension, it's probably uh, uh, not a good uh, criterion. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So that's why, you know, uh, for people who are really interested in the optimal value of the optimal transport problem, in the optimal transport cost, then basically those are people who do operations research and they use very different algorithms. But if you're, if, if you're working, you know, optimal transport, I, I think for me the main difference between optimal transport and operations research is that in, op, in the optimal transport community, we are more interested in the value of the Wasserstein distance and maybe in getting a good enough transport plan than we are in the precise, uh, you know, in the precise value of the permutation sigma. So that's, that's how the fields have kind of diverged. And it's implicit in most fields in computational optimal transport that we accept this approximation as a way of you know, spinning things up. So, okay, so that's what we have in mind. And maybe to let you get an intuition of those algorithms, I want to show you uh, how, basically, how they behave iteratively. So here I'm showing you uh, an optimal transport problem in dimension two. So I have maybe 1,000 red points here and 1,000 blue points here, okay, with varying weights. So that's, you know, I work in the unit square and what I want to get to retrieve is, you know, in red, uh, in, uh, in green, I want to retrieve this optimal transport plan between the two. So that's my target and the key insight of Kantorovich is that this transport plan, you should not encode it using a big matrix, but you can encode it in two, uh, in two functions that are defined on the space that we call the dual potentials, and that I display here using those red and uh, blue contour lines. I don't know if you can see them. Oh, yes, yeah, quite well. Okay, the idea here is that, for instance, uh, if you take the blue contour lines and you take their gradients, then you get exactly uh, the, ve the, the vector that, that maps a red point onto its target in the blue set. And uh, conversely, the, the, the field of arrows that takes the blue points onto the red ones is exactly the gradient of, uh, of the red uh, dual potential. So basically, the, here you, you can see that an arrow that takes, uh, basically a link that takes one blue point and maps it onto the target is always going to be orthogonal to the, le to the contour lines of the red potential. So just to tell you that what we're really interested in is, is in the, we are really interested in the, in, the, in the green transport plan, but the actual objects that are encoded in our computers are more like the dual potentials. So now, those, the algorithm that we use, I told you that they behave like generalized quick sort. And quick sort, it's a coarse to find algorithm, you know, divide and conquer. And that's exactly what happens with our solvers now. So given two input distributions, uh, so A and uh, B, basically we start with dual potentials that are extremely smooth. So smooth actually that they are affine functions. And so they are gradient, the gradient of an affine function is, uh, is, is a translation. 
here in this context. So basically, our, alg our algorithms at iteration zero uh, start with extremely smooth uh, dual potentials and so implicitly encode a transport plan, which is just a translation of the source distribution that ensures that, ensures that uh, the average value of the source distribution is mapped on the average value of the target distribution. And then the algorithm proceeds by iteratively uh, lowering uh, the smoothness criterion on the dual potentials. And so iteratively, we kind of allow uh, less smoothness, you know, so that's what I write here. So I'm going to divide the blurring radius on my dual potentials by two at every iteration. And slowly, okay, the idea is that slowly the algorithm is going to stop being blind to high frequency details, is going to see uh, you know, the differences in mass distributions and adjust accordingly. And now iteration, it, uh, iteration zero, the blur is equal to the diameter of the configuration, so one. Iteration one, the blur is equal to one half. Iteration two, one divided by four, etc. And iteratively, okay, because the equations were chosen well, basically the, the algorithm converges uh, very quickly towards uh, the optimal transport plan. Okay, so that's that's the mathematical behavior of the algorithm. Basically, the key insight is that you, you can divide the blurring scale and it's kind of equivalent to making, to making a divide and conquer algorithm. And then to speed things up, another insight is that, especially in the first few iterations, when we work with extremely, um, with extremely smooth dual potentials, then we can also work with subsampled uh, probability distributions. You, know, you do not need one million samples to to understand that the gradient of, a, of an affine function is a translation. Okay, and so that's why in practice, we start the first two iterations of our solvers work at core scale. And then uh, once we get to a certain level of detail, uh, we work with full resolution measures. Okay, and this trick is how you get from quadratic to log linear like or log linear ish complexity. So that's, uh, that's how those algorithms work. Uh, well, so it works extremely well uh, in low dimension. In high dimension, you still get this quadratic behavior. And another thing is that in low dimension, you can also use this to solve wasserstein barry center uh, interpolation problems. So the wasserstein barry center problem in high dimension, it's like NP-hard, it's a very complex problem, but in dimension two, three, four, it's very easy. Okay, and that, that's, uh, that's one of the main progresses of the, of the last few years. Okay, so the only thing that you have to keep in mind is that the progresses of the last decade uh, in our research have added up to an acceleration by two to three orders of magnitude. You know, if you take Syncon implemented on the GPU as baseline, you know this Marco Cuturi paper from 2013, then now you know that if you implement it using this Kiops library that I showed you earlier, if you use an annealing strategy and maybe a multi-scale decomposition of your input measures, then you can go 1,000 times faster. And it means with today's hardware that if, you, if you're just interested in getting an optimal transport plan with a precision of 1% approximately, then I think the most cost effective way of doing it is to uh, install this library, GMLOS, uh, buy a GPU or rent it or use an academic cluster, you know, basically 1,000 euros. And then you're able to work with, with 10,000 points in 30, 50 milliseconds and uh, 100,000 points in 100 to 200 milliseconds, so which was the objective. Now, that's good, and quickly you know, to, to finish, how do people use uh, those tools in 2022? So the first uh, thing, obviously, because you know, I present to you a very biased view of the field, and it's important to keep in mind that other people have different motivations, develop other types of solvers. Okay, we know that since the 1990s, Optimal transport is an essential tool to deal with flows, uh, mostly for theoretical reasons. You know, you know that fundamental models have an appealing form if you see them through the optimal transport lens, like the incompressible Euler flow is a, ge is a geodesic trajectory, or heat diffusion is gradient descent in Wasserstein space. And this framework has allowed mathematicians to study those models from a new perspective, so quite effectively. And what's great, and I think it's really interesting, is that implementations of those ideas, you know, in the PD context, in 2D, 3D, are now becoming major. 
So if you look at the web pages of like the Mocaplan in Ria team, Bruno Levy, Quentin Merigo, and all those people, you can find really cool simulations of crowds, water, or the early universe that rely on similar ideas like multi-scale optimal transport, but probably the, the, mo the biggest difference with the code that I develop is that when you do PDE theory, you're interested in like enforcing strong constraints like the density, particles cannot go there, or uh, density is, uh, there is an upper bound on the, on the density, above, above one, etc. And so this literature, like those people develop solvers in which it's very idiomatic to enforce those constraints. And so it, it, it allows them to generate very nice uh, flows, okay? like in 3D, uh, very impressive. Now, personally, the motivation uh, that pushed me to, to develop all of this is a long registration. Uh, so the kind of data that I, that I have is that here I'm showing you four pairs of uh, lungs. Uh, the upper row in red is when people are expiring, and the bottom row is when people are inspiring. <gasps> And so we observe both snapshots as at uh, two seconds of interval, and we know that there should be a geometric point-to-point point -point correspondence uh, between the two point clouds. Okay, so that's, and if you're able to retrieve this point-to-point -point correspondence between your two 3D images, then you have understood how people are breathing, and then you're able to correlate the breathing movement with other indications. So it's very typical, I think, of challenging uh, problems in medical imaging because we have very complex deformations. We have high resolution data, like you need to scale up to at least 50,000 points if you want to understand this data. And we need to solve this to a high accuracy. Okay, like baselines exist to solve this problem to an accuracy of one millimeter, it's just that they are very slow. And our research today is about taking run times from 30 minutes to one second okay, to enable large scale analysis. So if you ask today to someone, how am I going to solve it? Uh, I think an average uh, researcher or an average PhD student is going to tell you, you should use a point neural network. And okay, I've done that for two years. Basically a point neural network, it's an architecture, it's a trainable architecture that takes as input the two, uh, two point clouds, source and target, computes the scriptors at all scales, and then uh, match those pyramids of descriptors using geometric layers, and then in a course to find fashion, uh, generates a 3D velocity field. And the remarkable thing about those architectures is that they are very easy to train on synthetic deformations, and they are remarkably good at pairing branches. Like I think if you come from applied mathematics and you train those, um, those networks, it's, they are remarkably good at identifying that you know this point here, you know, it's a point where you have a large branch and then three small branches, it should be matched to this point. You know, those kind of uh, descriptors are really what is captured by those convolutional architectures in 3D point clouds. And so the networks uh, do it well. But on the other hand, it's frustratingly hard to train those models to a high accuracy. And then when you see that, you realize that it's exactly uh, those are methods that, are that have very complementary strengths and weaknesses compared with mathematical methods like optimal transport. And that's why I think that if you ask people today, uh, especially in the industry or people who are pragmatic about their data, they're going to tell you that the, the best way of solving this type of registration problem is to use uh, a modular pipeline where, where, where first, okay, you do an affine registration then you use your uh, point neural network to register the shapes up to maybe a three to five millimeter error. And then you use something like nearest neighbor projection or better optimal transport uh, to get the pixel perfect uh, result. Okay, and when you do that, essentially you get something which is easy to train on, on synthetic data that is now scalable. You see, it was not scalable 10 years ago, but now with our progresses, you can implement it on clouds of 100,000 points in one second and it gives very uh, competitive results on things like outdoor scans uh, or learn registration. So just to show you what this looks like, here I have my target point cloud in blue, and this is my source, uh, you know, expiration. So this is input data, and this is what the data looks like after the affine pre-alignment. 
So basically, I have just inflated the, uh, this point cloud using an affine transform. Maybe from, uh, from afar, it looks like uh, the two point clouds are now nearly the same, but if you, uh, if you put the two images on top of each other and uh, you zoom in, you realize that no, no, it's not good enough at all. So that's the first step. Second step is to use a plant neural network to align uh, those two pre-registered point clouds, and this is a typical result of what you get. Okay? This is typically what the output of a state-of-the-art point neural network looks like. You get something where clearly the branches have been matched together, but where you have those small, very annoying errors, like three, five millimeters errors, uh, and getting rid of them using only deep learning is very hard. And obviously when you see that, you realize, oh, this is actually the best case scenario for optimal transport that I presented to you earlier. And so you think, okay, maybe I can just choose optimal transport as nearest neighbor projection plus this incompressibility constraint that makes sense in this context to, get so, to, to fine tune the result and get something that is really appealing you know, without having had to train a massive point neural network. Okay. Because okay, training neural network, you get to a plateau and then diminishing returns. So you can always say, yeah, but if you, if you use a larger network, maybe you're going to get bet, bet, better results. Yes, but larger network means more time, it's more expenses. Uh, so it's, it's really better to try to combine uh, strengths of different methods. So that's one thing. And finally, uh, as you've probably seen uh, in, the, in the week, optimal transport, it's a very intriguing tool uh, in machine learning because it allows us to lift to probability distributions the geometry of the sample space. That's what I showed you with the Gaussians. So that's relevant everywhere at the intersection between geometry and statistics to design two sample tests, uh, to quantify the discrepancy between a synthetic sample uh, and the data distribution or uh, from a theoretical perspective to study the convergence of many uh, non-convex uh, optimization algorithms. So that's the context. And then, so it's very, very fast. Basically, what are, I think, uh, important open problems? So the first thing is that now that we have those very fast routines to compute distances, Wasserstein distances and Wasserstein barycenters, then probably, we can use them to generalize to Wasserstein space what we already know on, um, on vector spaces like regression methods. Okay? And that's what the talk of, uh, I think, what the talk of Olga Müller is going to be about tomorrow, or well, maybe she has changed, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, that's one field. Second thing is that everything I showed to you so far, you know, re relies on results and heuristics that essentially hold for simple convex cost functions like the distance, the square distance function, and I always assume that I could evaluate the distance between two points quickly. But now, what about concave costs? You know, like just something like the square root of the distance, we know that it induces a completely different geometry on the, uh, on the optimal transport plan, and this is not something that has been studied well. Second is that it's, it's important for people to work in discrete metric spaces like graphs with a geodesic distance. And on a graph, you do not have access to a simple formula to evaluate the distance between two points. So can you generalize uh, the solvers that are presented to you to those spaces? I don't know. And finally, could we possibly guarantee some smoothness on the transport map while keeping superfast solvers? That's a very open question because we know how to guarantee smoothness, but we destroy uh, computational efficiency. If we could get the best of both worlds, that would be great. So, and finally, okay, optimal transport is uh, it's a source of inspiration in high dimensional scenarios. Okay, we've seen that optimal transport due to the curse of dimensionality, the vanilla optimal transport metric is not very interesting uh, in cases of dimension more than 10. But the recent progresses in the theoretical machine learning literature I've shown that we can build upon the intuitions of optimal transport about the theoretical results of optimal transport to try to define interesting divergences between probability distributions in higher dimensional spaces. So in all of that, I think my job is primarily to focus on the software because I'm happy to do that and I secure the position at INRIA where uh, it's, uh, it's incentivized. So very happy to uh, develop libraries, make them more accessible, maintain benchmarking platforms. 
Uh, and as a conclusion, obviously, all of that, it's very much a big teamwork, okay? Like, especially the, the code, the ideas, uh, it's impossible to do it on your own. So I'm very grateful to all those people. I'm, I'm too late to, to tell you who did what, but uh, clearly those are all very important. Um, and yeah, if you had to, to, to recall just two key points on today's talk, is that optimal transport from a computational perspective, we understand it as generalized sorting. So we, ha we now have super fast solvers on simple domains. It provides simple registration for shapes that are close to each other. Uh, and it provides very interesting geometric uh, questions uh, today in, in machine learning. And finally, the GPUs, okay, only 15% of you uh, had already used one. Frankly, it's way more versatile than we think. So it's not only to do uh, deep learning, there's ongoing work around the world to provide, uh, to provide fast GPU backends uh, for operations that Google and Facebook don't want to pay for, like optimal transport. And so I think you can be fairly optimistic uh, about the state of our software environment. So obviously all of this is documented online. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them after, you know, in the break, because I think that I'm too late. Thank you. So yes, we're late, but we have time for one or two questions, maybe.